Come on. Praise God. Praise God this morning. We're here to worship and to praise the King of glory. The mighty God who we just, we just honored and worshiped for rising from the dead and paying our sin debt. We serve a great God. There's nothing you have need of this morning that the God that we serve cannot fix for you. Amen. Uh, before we actually get into the morning worship, I want to uh, just say thank you for all of you coming. We have a, a special guest this morning, Sister Ann, Janice's sister. Praise God. She's come to be with us. Thank God Ashley even made Sunday school this morning. Amen. And her youngin'. So I thank God for that. God is able this morning. Ashley in, in June is going to be dedicating her children to the Lord. So we want to keep that in prayer. God is so good. Isn't it great when you think enough of your family and enough of the Lord Jesus Christ that you say, I want to commit my children? Yeah. Yeah. So God can watch over them and take yeah. care of them and lead and guide their lives. That is so good when somebody does that. Does somebody over here have a prayer request this morning? Gary, good to see you here too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, we'll remember that. Okay. Jesus. Judy. Okay, remember her. We want to remember Emma. Emma, uh, it, the, the surgery was more extensive than what they thought, and Emma's in a lot of pain, and she needs our prayers. Somebody over here have a prayer request, Steph. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's remember that. God's able. And yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's let's remember that, Tangy. Okay. All right, let's remember that. Also, by way of announcements, most of you know we pray here on Monday evenings for anybody that wants to drop in from 5.30 to 7 and stay as long as you need to stay. We just come in and pray, and uh, we go out as God leads us to go out. Wednesday night, I'll be ministering the Word of God. This Sunday coming up, remember, is Pastor Appreciation Day. Next Sunday, there'll be no Sunday school. We would begin our service at 1030 that morning. And we've got singers coming from Tennessee, Jennifer and Rebecca. And they're coming to give us a gospel singing that morning. And we're going to eat afterwards and no service that night. So let's remember that. Did everybody get that? Yes. There's a sign-up sheet on a bulletin board on uh, just look at it concerning the food that you may need to, you know, to fix for next Sunday. So take a look at that as you go out, ladies. All right. Would you stand any behind me? Uh, Ryan, his family, he had, his aunt passed away. Okay. All right. Unspoken. Yes. Amen. God knows every need. He sees every hand. Let's just take it to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, as we come into you this morning. God, I thank you for Calvary. I thank you that you're a prayer answering God, a God of mercy. Remember Harold this morning and Joyce, God, as we pray for them. We thank you for bringing him through what you brought him through. And you're going to continue to touch his body. Other requests and other needs, God, that have been spoken forth and, and hands that have gone up. God, you, you're the one who searches the hearts and you know the thoughts and every word, God, has been lifted up before you this morning. And God, we're just believing that a mighty, mighty move of your spirit is taking place. Lord, would you touch our singers and our musicians, Sean and Travis, having to work this morning. God, would you be with them? Sean going to be ministering this evening and we pray for him, God, that you touch Sean as he comes to preach the word of God tonight. And God, would you just move mightily 
in this house this morning to heal, deliver, and set free as we come to you. Mighty God, this morning, we honor you in this house. We worship you in this house. We appreciate you this morning. Almighty God, have your way, God, as we minister and touch our singers and musicians this morning and use them in a great way. In Jesus' name. Now, as we worship this morning, you, you can stand or sit ever how you're comfortable. Judy's going to give us a song, and then I want the ushers to come after we sing this first song this morning. Go ahead, Judy. Sing with her this morning. This world of sorrow. One day we're going to get into eternity and we're going to know in the fullness of the things that God wants us to know. Isn't that great this morning? My goodness gracious, thank God this morning. We're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings give as God has given unto you. Good to see that Brandy and this other lady, I forgot your name. I'm sorry, I apologize. Was here. Good to see her back again. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Brother Richard, would you pray? Oh my God, come before you. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you
Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. God, you're awesome. You're so mighty. Katamoshita. Yes. Amen. Now let's worship.
good time? He is good. He is good. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Children's church is being turned loose. Children can go to children's church with Carol Lee. Praise God. Amen. We had so many of them going back there last week. I didn't know if Carolee and Dennis would make it. <laughs> but they got through it, praise God. I was thinking, thank God it's them and not me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Yes. Amen this morning. All right, we're going to get right into the Word of God this morning. I'm going to be reading some scripture out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. Let me pray before I go any farther. Almighty God, I do glorify you this morning. I thank you that you're God. There's nothing, Lord, that we could have need of that you wouldn't do for your children. You're a God who loves us, who cares this morning. And if there's one who may be listening, maybe by even live streaming, they're lost or they're backslidden, I pray that you would touch that heart or that life this morning. If there's somebody discouraged, God, would you encourage their hearts, I pray. Have your way in this service this morning because, Father, we can't do anything without your Spirit. It takes the life of your Spirit this morning to do the work that needs to be accomplished. And we'll be ever mindful to praise you in this house this morning. And the church says, Amen. Out of Isaiah 49, verses 14 through 16. Blueprints in the hands of Jesus. But Zion said, Zion meaning the people who lived in the city of God, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. And that's the Lord God speaking. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls, thy walls are continually before me. And the church says, Amen to the reading of the Word of God. You might be seated there as I get just a little bit of background for where we're coming from out of the book of Isaiah. In this scripture reading, Isaiah, God is giving him a prophetic outlook into something that is going to take place in the near future from Isaiah's day. It would be a time when Zion, the city of God, would be destroyed. It was a time when the Babylonian army is going to attack Jerusalem. And God's people and the city will end up being completely in ruins. We find this prophecy taking place actually in the writings of Jeremiah when Jeremiah discusses what took place when this actually happened. And the temple of Solomon in that day was destroyed. That great edifice that was built to house the mighty Spirit of God that nothing or nobody can really house him. And the enemy, the Babylonians, came in and they destroyed the city. They took salt and salted the fields so that no food would be able to be grown there. 
some of the fields that were cleared in that day, the enemy took huge stones and rolled them into the fields. They burnt the houses of the people. In other words, it was to be a total destruction of the people of God. And in our scripture reading, Isaiah is prophesying of this time that it would take place. And Brother Richard, you brought out a little bit of it in your Sunday school. It was to be a judgment of God upon a people who had turned their backs upon God. They had long forgotten Him. God's Word is the pattern for what takes place over and over and over in Scripture. His people would commit ungodly sins. And God would have to send them into bondage and captivity. The first thing that God would do to a people or a nation who goes into sin is that God will give them the word. He would send ministers. He would send prophets into the land. And he will warn the people, turn, turn before it's too late. And then when the people will not listen, the next thing that God does is natural, what so-called natural disasters will begin to take place. He's trying to get the attention of the people. There will be floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunamis. Everything will take place trying to wake up a nation or a people who refuse to get out of sin. Until finally, the final thing, over and over and over, it took place in the Word of God when they would not listen, is that God will send in a foreign nation who will take His people into captivity. And if America does not turn around soon... I'm awful afraid that this is exactly where America is headed next. But we see God's people. Terry, can you give me just a drop in this? I think they're turned up here is what's wrong. I'm not hearing myself. But this is a people that we're seeing in this prophecy and we are seeing God's people, this one over here please, Brother Wayne, sift in the ashes of their lives. Why are they doing that? Because at that time, they lost it all. It reminds me of the war that's taking place in Ukraine right now. Thank you, Brother Wayne. You think of the people. Everybody over there is not bad. There's a lot of good people over there. There are children, there are women. What's taking place? They're being raped. They're being murdered. They're being killed. They're stored mass graves everywhere. I don't know why America thinks that we're going to be free from that. We're not. I'm telling you, children, if you think about it, America's not even seen in the end time. They don't even help Israel in the end times. My goodness. I could preach right there this morning. But I've got, I've got to be careful because I really get turned on when I, when I think about the things, the horrors that are taking place in our world. Why somebody doesn't destroy that, that murderer, that monster over there. But he was prophesied these things will take place. It's leading up to the battles of Gog and Magog. And I've got to quit right there. I'm not preaching on that this morning. But I get riled up when I think about what's taking place and what is going to happen. You cannot stop the prophecies of God because it's history in reverse and because it's not that God's making it happen. It's that God saw it in the future and wrote it down that it will happen. Mm. Let me get off that. But we see it in God's people as they sift in the ashes of their lives as they have lost everything. At this time, they are in despair. And that's when they say in chapter 49, 
God has forgotten us. He has forsaken us. And the Lord begins to answer his people back again. And he gave them hope. God always will leave hope for you. If you will repent, if you will turn around from the lifestyle that you are living, God always will reach out his arms to you. He leaves a hope in there that you can recover if you will turn. And we know that they went into captivity into Babylon for 70 years they were there. They were slaves. They were prisoners in a foreign land 1,500 miles away from Jerusalem. And in the book of Nehemiah, it talks about this, how that they destroyed the cities and the gates of the cities had been burnt and with fire and the walls of the city of Jerusalem were destroyed. And again, Israel was in despair. And God answers and God asks them a question in verse chapter 49, verse 15. When they're complaining... When they're saying, you have left us, they had actually left God. And he asked this question, can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And you know what he says? Yes, a woman can do that. It's an abomination, but they can. Yet he said, I will not forget you. God says, yes, that can happen with people. We see this going on every day of the world. People get so hard-hearted and sinful that they will literally abandon their own children and their families and, and they'll run after the things of the world. And Brother Richard, you said it's our flesh. And it is. And people always make excuses when they do that. They blame it on you or they blame it on me or they blame it on somebody else. Somebody else is always at fault. But they are are the ones who have left God. And this is why we're seeing single parents and we're seeing grandparents and raising children and thank God for them for being willing to take those children that somebody failed and somebody forsook. And God is saying in verse 15, will you basically, he's saying, will you compare me? To a human man or woman? And again, the truth is that Israel had what brought God down to their own level. They felt like in their mind's eye that because they forsook their children, so God was forsaking them. But God said, I am God. I am not like you. You see, God is full of mercy. He's full of compassions, and His compassions fail not. He's tender, and He's love. And when others will cast you aside and give up on you and say that you are no good, He's not like that. He's not like a mama or a daddy who walked away from you and abandoned you or a husband or a wife who abandoned you. But we serve a God in heaven who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. I will not turn my back on my children. Others may forsake you, but he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Amen this morning. We serve a God and children even when we fall into sins and he has to bring judgment upon us if we will repent and call upon his name and turn back to him then God will hear us and save us and mend us and restore us and the things back into our lives man sister Tangie is cruel 
man is cruel, I'm telling you. Man will walk out on you. They will, they will turn their back on the covenant that they made with you. They'll give up on you and they'll see no value in you. But God sees you and he has prepared and he has ordained a destiny for you in this life if you will receive it. And if you will call upon him, and when we call upon God, who is a God who's willing to forgive us, he will. Aren't you glad that God has forgiven you this morning? Give him a hand clap of praise. He did it by his mighty grace and his power. God told Israel, in the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 12, Thus saith the Lord. He says, As a shepherd takes out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of ear, so will the children of Israel be taken who dwell in Samaria or in the corner of a bed or in Damascus in a couch. Now remember, the ten tribes were called Israel. There was a tribe of Judah, two of them were in there, called Judah. At one time, it was carried away into Samaria, because Samaria was the capital city of Israel at that time. The Assyrians took them away, but the two tribes known as Judah were carried, the ones carried away to Babylon for 70 years, and Jerusalem was destroyed, and Amos was dealing with them in their captivity. And listen, we have all been there when we said, God... I don't know how you're going to turn this thing around. There is so much chaos in this situation. And Israel is feeling this way. And I'll explain the shepherd and the ear and the legs when I get there in just a minute. But Israel is feeling like there's no hope for them. There's no way that they can get through this. And God says through Amos, I am going to be like the shepherd. Who when the lion comes and takes a sheep away from me, from the flock, and tries to destroy it, I will go out there and if there's nothing but an ear and two legs that are left, I will take that pieces out of the lion's mouth and I will restore it again. Why would a shepherd do that? He was risking his own life. They would tell you it was because most shepherds were hired out to tend somebody else's flock and that they, if a lion took one of the sheep that he had to prove that it was taken and not stolen by himself. But I don't agree with that. Because God would not compare himself, who is the shepherd, he would not compare himself to a hireling. God is not a hireling, and neither are his shepherds, his under shepherds, are not hirelings. But God said, I'm going to pull you out of the mouth of the lion of the enemy. And God says, when he does that... He's not going to wait for that lion to start chewing you up and devouring you and then walking away. That's what a hireling would do. But God says, I'm going to go to that lion. I'm going to pull out whatever is left because that shepherd still sees the value in what's left of that sheep. Hallelujah. Even though... You may be torn up. You may be wounded. The shepherd still sees your value. Glory to God. That's how our shepherd sees us, Brother Richard. When our lives are broken and our lives are empty and others think that we're useless, God still sees something to salvage in our lives. Man will kick you out. They'll throw you away, but God will not do that. 
holy God. Did God do that? Did he salvage those ten tribes and then those two tribes? Did he ever put them all back together again? Did they ever get back to their homeland? Yes, hallelujah to God. And there's coming a day, according to the book of Revelation, that's how I know he did. When the book of Revelation, John said, I look, and I saw 144,000 of them. 12,000 from each of the tribes. 12 into 144,000 is 12. That tells me all 12 tribes were at one time united back together again. They had to be. Children of God, they had to be. Ooh, let me throw this in here. In the day we're living in, that 144,000 in the end time will be evangelists and they will preach the word of God through the tribulation period. But they have to be from the original 12 tribes and they have to be living in national Israel at the time they do that. They were scattered. For 2,000 years in 70 AD, by Titus come in. I can't go into all of it. They were scattered, but God said, I'm going to, I'm going to regather my people back again. And we saw this take place in May of 1948 when Israel was declared a nation again for the first time in 2,000 years. And the, the great people began, the great call went out from God. And the Israeli people, the Jewish nation, began like homing pigeons going back to their homeland, to Jerusalem, going back home. Those tribes had to be back in national Israel. One of them was lost, the tribe of Dan. Nobody knew where it was. Nobody had ever found in 2,000 years. It was called the lost tribe of Dan. Lost to man, but never to God. They were found, and they were found living in Ethiopia, and they were called Falashas, which means exiles, and they brought them, as a matter of fact, the United States of America did something good for a change, and they helped to take some of them back to their homeland. It was called Operation Moses. They're in the homeland, children of God. Richard told us in the Sunday school lesson last week about that man. He was listening to what was he called? He was he was a he was a Jew who was called back to his land, a rabbi. But what was his duty there? Say it again. They called him back to Jerusalem to get certified in how to make the sacrifices. And they're, they're calling them. It had to do with the red heifer. Oh, let me get off of that. But I'm here to tell you, the God that we serve, if he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But God is talking about the city of Jerusalem there. And at that time, he's talking about it. It's already been destroyed now. And there's nothing there. And they're saying, God, are you going to forget Jerusalem? God says, how can I forget Zion, the holy city? As a matter of fact, I have engraved the future construction plans for it in the palms of my hands. He says, the blueprints that tell me where to put the walls. Remember the original scriptures I read? The walls are there. And he's looking at his hands and he sees exactly where he's going to rebuild those walls at. He has a blueprint. He had the plan. And when we build something, we have to have a blueprint. We have to have a, a plan. But God has already taken care of it. God says, I have engraved the walls of Jerusalem in the palms of my hands. He said, they are ever before me. I will not forget them. Do you know, that's why married folk wear a ring, so they won't forget they're married. Amen. Somebody ought to agree with that. Seriously, though, the hand is attached to the body. And it reminds you that you are in covenant with your spouse. You see, your hand is unique. 
It's different from billions and billions of people that have ever been born on the face of this earth. The prints on your fingertips and in the palms of your hand are unique. Do you know we are all unique in God's eyes? God has not mass produced us like clones. God made each of us different. And God says, I have also written down the future plans of New Jerusalem. Everything was the blueprints in his hands. He says, I, I even have your name written in the palm of my When I look down, I see Janice. When I look down, I see Richard. When I see Richard, I see Janice. I see everything about them from the beginning to the end. I know everything about their lives. I have the blueprints in my hands for them. Woo! And no matter what they face, I'm going to see to it that the footsteps of a good man or a good woman are ordered of the Lord and they're going to come out the way that I desire for them to come out. And he says, I have the blueprints for New Jerusalem, the city for its occupants. He looks down this, this morning. He sees those that are born again believers. He knows those that are going to occupy the city of New Jerusalem one day. Listen, the city that's built four square, 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide. It has walls of jasper. He knows those walls because he's the one fashioning them. It has gates of pearl. It has streets of gold. It has all of these things. And God knows exactly how to fashion that city. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the walls, he said, are continually before me. And he's saying, Israel, you can't see it now. It looks hopeless to you. Have you ever felt hopeless? Have you ever looked out on your situation in your life and said, this is hopeless? What am I going to do? How is this ever going to get undone? And he's talking to the church as well. Do you not know this morning, as I've just stated, that the story of your life is in his hands? Nothing surprises God. I don't care what happens to you. It throws us up in the air. We wring our hands. We cry. But God said it's nothing I haven't seen before. And it's nothing I didn't know was going to take place beforehand. I have prepared for it. Just listen for my voice. I will lead you. I will guide you. Hallelujah to God. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the first and the last. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. God has the first say in your life if you will let him and he will have the last you see the devil does not have the last say in your life what he did to you he thought it would destroy you but God is just turning that thing around brother Richard and he's using it for his good and he's going to show the devil that devil you're going to wish one day you would never done what you did to my child because they're going to turn around and they're going to tear down your kingdom. Woo! The devil does not have the last say so. If you will allow him, he will bring the blessed end to what he started in your life. In the book of Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17 and 18 Nehemiah was God's man that God chose to sit to rebuild the gates of Jerusalem when the Babylonians and all had come in and torn them down. And in Nehemiah, we are seeing the fulfilling of Isaiah 49 who prophesied that it would take place. And we're seeing the brokenness turn back into wholeness. The rubble turn back into homes and the ashes turn back into timbers and out of the ashes God is restoring a people 
people in a city that looked like it was unrestorable. And God called Nehemiah with a specific job. And it was to rebuild the walls. And it was to redo the gates. He set up the gates in 52 days. It was a miracle that they could do that. But God sent him to do it. In chapter 2, 17, he went to the people in Jerusalem. They come back out of the Babylonian captivity. A generation of them. They were so many that went into captivity. A lot of them died there, the older people. The younger ones were still alive. There were some born in captivity. But when it come, the 70 years was up. And God sent word that they were to come out of captivity. Only a few of them even desired to come out and go back to Jerusalem. The rest of them had become Babylonianized. They loved the world they were living in. They loved the sins that Babylon represented. But God, thank God, had a remnant of people who came out of there and began to rebuild back what had been torn down. And Nehemiah goes there and he said, Then said I unto them... You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste. The gates thereof are burned with fire. And come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. At this time, Israel's discouraged. They're sitting there not knowing where to start. They, at this time, didn't even know how to pray. And they sat there, and they just said, Oh God! Oh God! Come on, I've been there. I've been there when I couldn't pray, Brother Richard. When the problems were so bad, and I had to depend on what I knew about my God, that my God would be faithful to me, even when I couldn't pray. He knew all the prayers in the past that I had prayed, and I depended upon that. And they just cried out and said, Oh, God. And then Nehemiah says in verse 18, Then I told them of the hand of my God which is good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nehemiah said, Let me tell you how the hand of God has been upon me. Remember Isaiah said, the blueprints were written upon God's hands. And now Nehemiah says, the good hand of the Lord has been upon me. Nehemiah caught a vision of the blueprints of God for his people. And God gave Nehemiah instructions somewhere along the way of what he wanted done and how to do it. And Nehemiah said, we're going to do this thing. We're going to rise up out of the ashes of destruction because the hand of the Lord is upon me. Is the hand of the Lord upon you? Think about it. Jerusalem, he said, has not been forsaken. Jerusalem, God said, I have not forgotten you. But all of this is the rebuilding, the repairing, the plan of God. And God can do that for this church as well. And he can do it for your life with whatever situation you are going through. God is a master builder. He can repair the waste places of your life this morning. Remember, God pulled Job out of the ashes of what was what was once his family. And he blessed him double in the end. And he's the same master builder today as he was then. He can rebuild our lives. He can rebuild our families. He can rebuild our health. Many of you, your life was in the ashes when he found you. Think about what you come out of. Listen, he pulled you out of the lion's mouth. 
out of the mouth of that lion and there was only a leg or an ear left or maybe a toe or a finger. Maybe you were beaten and broken. You might have been bruised and abused on your way to hell. But God pulled you out of the lion's mouth, children. And God is looking for broken vessels this morning that he can mend, that he can take his hands and he can remake you all over again. And he'll take your life if you will let him. In all the troubles, in all of your sins, he will change you and give you a new life if you will just repent. John chapter 20, verse 25. <clears throat> when Jesus, one time after he arose, and he appeared unto his disciples after his resurrection, they saw him. They had seen him on the cross. They knew how he had been beaten until he was unrecognizable. They saw the agony and the torture that he went through. They had been with him for over three years. They forsook everything in order to follow him. And now it looks like it was all buried in a barred tomb with him. And they looked. All of a sudden, coming through the walls was Jesus. Do you hear me? They were gathered there trying to salvage their life, trying to salvage their reputation. At one time, Peter said, I go fishing again. They didn't know what to do. But he came into the room where they were at, Brother Richard. And you might not know it or realize it, but he has come through the walls here this morning. He's in the midst of his people. And he looks at those disciples. Thomas, who had said, I won't believe he's alive unless I see him with my own eyes and thrust my hands into his, his, his side and see the, the prints in his palms. And Jesus said, Thomas, put your hands in my side. I can just, look, Thomas, look at my feet, look at my hands. Look, Thomas, these holes that are in Christ's hands are the blueprints, children of God, for the salvation and the repair and the restoration of mankind. You hear me this morning? Why did they leave the prince there? As a perpetual reminder. Because one day he's coming. He said, Thomas, this thing's not over with. This is only the beginning. And one day I'm going to return again. And when I do, I'm going to set my feet down on the Mount of Olives, uh, the same mountain that he left from. Uh, and I'm going to hold up my hands. Uh, and the people are going to see. And they're going to say, where did you receive the wounds uh, that are in your hands and in your side and so on? And he's going to say I was wounded in the house of my friends come on Judy oh holy God holy God that's the only prince only wounds are going to be left there because Jesus Christ is our redeemer our redeemer and our savior John said in Revelation chapter 5 he said I saw a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world would you stand all over the house? Jesus allowed those wounds as a perpetual reminder, Brother Richard, that not only is he coming back again, but he is the only way to heaven. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father, except by Jesus. I can't fix anybody's life. I can't do it. I can tell you how to get it fixed. Alcohol won't help you. Drugs won't help you. Sex won't help you. You can't fix your destiny with them. Neither can any religion or any man fix your life but Jesus Christ 
the lamb can. The answer lies in the nail-scarred hands of our Lord and our Savior. And I wonder this morning if there might be somebody listening, maybe here in the church, maybe by live streaming. They're going to cut live streaming off in, in just a little while, not yet, but in a few minutes. And we're going to have an altar call. But I wonder if anybody listening, if they're lost, would you bow your heads all over the house? Maybe you're a sinner. You've never accepted him into your life. Oh, children, you don't have long. You don't have long. Today's the day of salvation. This thing is winded up. You need the Lord in your heart and in your life. Maybe there's somebody that once served God. They worked, maybe even worked in the church. But things have taken place in their life and they no longer go to the house of God. I wonder, would you accept the nail prints, the hands that have been lifted out to you of God? Would you come back to the Father's house? Would you bow your knees somewhere and say, Father, forgive me. Take me back to the Father's house. I want to live for you. I don't want to die lost. I don't want my family to die lost. You're coming back soon, and I want to be prepared. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, I've done the best of my ability this morning to try to bring out the nail prints in your hands that are the blueprints for humanity, for every individual's life. You've got a plan. You've got a destiny for them. If they would just receive you and accept that, they can live with you in heaven one day. Oh God, would you touch that heart of that life that's nearest to eternity lost. That one that's struggling this morning and they're discouraged and maybe they've been hurt somewhere along the way and, and they've backed away from church and away from you because of that hurt. I pray that they'll say, forgive me because I forgive them who hurt me and that accept you back into their lives. God saved somebody this morning. Touch a heart or a life this morning in the name of Jesus. I wonder if there's somebody here and I'm going to open this altar. Do you need to come? Do you want to make your way up to this altar? Would you say, Sister Luke, I need prayer this morning. I need help this morning. I need God in my life. Do you have a need that you need to come and pray about? The altars are open. Go ahead, Sister Judy.